Welcome to FCPA Flash, the official podcast of FCPA professor moderated by Professor Mike Kaler. FCPA professor is the leading source of daily FCPA news and commentary and the most authoritative source for those seeking to understand and apply the FCPA. To learn how FCPA professor can elevate your FCPA knowledge, please visit www.fcpaprofessor.com. FCPA Flash is sponsored by Kroll. Kroll is trusted by companies and compliance officers worldwide to help prevent, detect, and remediate FCPA challenges with scalable end-to-end compliance solutions. From high-volume third-party screening and automated monitoring, to risk-based due diligence, to complex investigations and monitorships, with leading experts, global resources, and advanced technology, Kroll is uniquely positioned to meet all your FCPA needs. Thank you for listening to the FCPA Flash Podcast. This is Professor Mike Kaler, and I invite you to my next FCPA Institute in Indianapolis on September 28th through the 29th. To learn more about the two-day FCPA Institute and how it has elevated the FCPA knowledge and practical skills, of a diverse group of professionals, please visit fcpaprofessor.com and click on the FCPA Institute page. Welcome to FCPA Flash. This is Professor Mike Kaler, and in today's episode, I'm pleased to be joined by Kara Brockmeyer. From 2011 to earlier this year, Ms. Brockmeyer served as the SEC's FCPA Unit Chief, and she is currently a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Debevoise in Plimpton. Thanks for joining me today, Kara. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me, and I'm very pleased to be here. So looking back at your time as FCPA Unit Chief, what do you believe was the most significant, not necessarily from a settlement amount perspective, but the most significant case brought by the SEC, and what, in your opinion, made it the most significant case? Well, I wouldn't point to any specific specific case, because I think that you're you're right, you can't judge the effect that a program has had by looking at a single case. What I, what I think has been the most significant thing that's happened over the past five and a half years has really been a maturing of SCPA enforcement within the U.S. I think the government as a whole has gotten more sophisticated about the way they look at cases, the their ability to get information and evidence and witnesses from overseas, and um, definitely their sophistication in terms of assessing what the profits are and determining what the appropriate um, remedy should be. So I think things like um, at the SEC, we brought on forensic accountants to help the attorneys figure out the dollars and where the money was going and trace things through made a big difference in in our ability to sort of keep up with the defense bar and the and um, the people on the other side of the table. the The other thing that I think has been talked about a lot and I think should continue to be talked about um, is the rise in global enforcement. I think this is one of the most exciting and interesting storylines that we've seen over the past few years and definitely came to fruition last year and I think we're going to see it continue and that was really um, due to both a, I, th- I think a, a maturing of other countries enforcement mechanisms a willingness for them to look at the way the US does it and learn some from the US but also a willingness um, by the US government to reach out to its foreign counterparts to help them develop a program I asked the same general question of uh, David Bitkower um, in the last podcast, former uh, DOJ official. With this increase in in global enforcement, um, do you think when it comes to foreign issuers that, you know, from a policy standpoint, there ought to be um, an SEC enforcement action if the foreign law enforcement agency, whether it's Brazil, whether it's the U.K., uh, brings a, a enforcement action against that foreign issuer? I think absolutely there should be an enforcement action, particularly by the SEC, where you're talking about a foreign company that is listed or was at the time listed and therefore taking advantage of the, of the U.S. capital markets. 
I think that you don't want to treat a foreign company differently than you would treat a domestic company. So, um, for example, if you have a foreign private company that lists in the U.S. and violates the FCPA, you want to make sure that there is an injunctive action or a cease and desist order in place so that if they violate the FCPA again, they can be treated as a recidivist. Um, you don't want to treat them differently than you would treat a company based in the, in the U.S. Now, that being said, I think the appropriate place to take into account action being taken by the domestic regulator. So in the case of a foreign company, it would be the, um, the regulator where the company is based or any other regulator that, um, that has jurisdiction over the conduct is in the, in the form of the resolution. And I think we saw that in the cases that were brought last year, if you look at Bimplecom Brimple, and Embraer and Brascom and Odebrecht and um, the case that was brought earlier this year, Rolls-Royce, I think there was a, a recognition by the U.S. government that having, in some cases, a majority of the monetary recovery go to another country is the appropriate way to handle it. But if you violate the law in three countries, it's fair that you get tagged in three countries. What are, uh, let's say, two or three specific things that FCPA practitioners or in-house counsel that deal with FCPA issues um, need to understand about SEC FCPA enforcement that you believe from your time as the FCPA unit chief were not well understood or not appreciated perhaps to the extent uh, they should have been? I think the, one of the first things is I, when I was the unit chief, would still get asked the question, why does the SEC even care about this? Isn't this a DOJ thing? Isn't it, you know, shouldn't bribery be um, something outside the securities laws? And um, I always felt very strongly that you have to go back to the reason why we had the FCPA in the first place, which was that companies in the U.S. were creating off-the-book slush funds to fund both domestic and foreign bribery. And Congress looked at that and said, we have a problem here because we're, we have no requirements for public companies to keep books and records that are accurate, that let shareholders know what the true value of the company is that they're investing in. And if you want to raise money from investors in the U.S. markets, you need to comply with, um, you need to comply with those laws. So I think one thing that I felt very strongly about when I was the head of the unit was that the books and records and internal controls provisions were equally important to the SEC's enforcement program as the 30A charges or the anti-bribery charges that the agency would bring, and that it was important for companies to be paying attention to their internal controls, particularly at foreign subsidiaries, not just for FCPA reasons, but also because we found... Um, when I was in the government, as you did an investigation, that often a company that had FCPA or bribery problems at a foreign subsidiary also had other problems at that subsidiary because the internal controls were weak. So it may be fraud or embezzlement or self-dealing. In fact, a pretty sizable number of the self-reports that came in during the time that I was unit chief came in because a company identified the conduct, not because they were looking at a potential bribe scheme, but because they were concerned about embezzlement or self-dealing or some other type of fraud going on. And in connection with doing an investigation into that, found that those same people that were embezzling or engaged in self-dealing were also bribing. Any other things that FCPA practitioners or in-house counsel uh, should understand or appreciate uh, better? I think one of the things that is um, that is probably the subject of an awful lot of ink um, and confusion is just how to count the number of cases because um, no one seems to agree on a number. The government has very clear statistics, so if you ever want to see the official numbers on how many SCPA cases there are in a given year, you can go to the SEC and the DOJ website and count those um, and count those cases. I think these cases are a little unusual um, for the securities world because there is often, in addition to an SEC action, also a DOJ action. And the two agencies have done an excellent job, I think, over time of working together for a resolution that um, doesn't 
doubly penalize the company. And so one thing that I, I think sometimes there's some confusion is that people forget if you see an SEC action and it refers to a DOJ action, you need to consider those two cases together when you're looking at the actual fines and disgorgement paid by um, those companies. So if you look, so that's why when you're running statistics, you can end up with, people sometimes end up with some pretty wild statistics because they forget. If you look at SEC actions on their own, you're not going to typically see monetary penalties being assessed against some of the most egregious cases. And the reason for that is not because the SEC doesn't think it was egregious conduct, but because that company's already paying a very significant criminal fine. And so if there's a criminal fine paid, usually the SEC will essentially give credit for that so the company's not being penalized twice. So people just need to keep in mind, you need to look at FCP enforcement, I think, holistically at what both the SEC and the DOJ are doing in any particular case. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I've, I've long advocated what I generically referred to as the core enforcement approach, and, and I agree. Uh, the FCPA is um, obviously a niche industry, and one sign of maturity within a niche industry is basic common defined terms. And, you know, I've written extensively about what is an FCPA enforcement action. Uh, you know, and that dynamic is not just present when you have SEC and DOJ enforcement actions based upon the same core conduct. But the DOJ frequently will, um, you know, bring an action against a foreign subsidiary as well as the parent company. And, and there's lots of people who, who double, triple, quadruple count those. And then you get statistics which show that there's like 55 or 60 FCPA enforcement actions in any given year, which, correct me if I'm wrong, the reality is in any given year, it's obviously going to fluctuate. We basically have about 10 to 20 core actions per year. Yeah, last year I think we had, last year was a high year. For the SEC, I think it was the the highest number of sort of individual actions. Um, it was pretty high for DOJ uh, as well. But generally, generally that's right. It's somewhere between 10 and 15 to 20. Um, 25 is, would be a, a very high year. And um, it's, I think, important for people to recognize that. It's, a, it's also not, because it's not a very large number of cases, there are going to be significant fluctuations year to year because these cases take a while to investigate. Any time that you have any type of um, financial crime, I mean, you investigate these cases very similar to the way you investigate an accounting fraud case, looking at a lot of the same documents. The only problem is typically all your witnesses and your documents are overseas, which means that it takes longer to get that information in, and you have a lot more complications you have to deal with, like data privacy um, laws and things like that. So it's important for people to realize that these cases do take a while, and so any year-to-year -year fluctuation is going to look like if you, you know, sort of run the, the numbers, it'll look like there's a big variation, but if you look over time, it's been relatively consistent. There was a big, there was a big jump last year, but a lot of that was we had, there were a lot of pharmaceutical cases that had, where investigations had begun about the same time, those cases were finishing up about the same time. Well, thanks for sharing that. You know, I keep FCPA statistics myself, and every time I, I do that, I sort of put the qualifier in that, you know, hey, the denominator here is literally 10 or 15, and because of that, any outlier, you know, a $100 million, $500 million enforcement action is going to st significantly skew those statistics. So, I think it's important uh, to, to hear that concept from, from people like you as well. The next question I have uh, revolves around uh, internal control violations. And, you know, in certain FCPA enforcement actions, the internal uh, control violations are, are, are clear and, and really no reasonable minds would, would suggest that there's not been an internal control um, violation. But in several FCPA enforcement actions, the SEC acknowledges you know, in the resolution document that the issuer did X, Y, or Z, yet one employee or a small group of employees circumvents whatever X, Y, or Z might be, and the issuer still finds uh, issuer internal control violations. Uh, my question is, given that the internal control vi uh, provisions specifically talk about reasonable assurances, and given prior SEC statements that you know, the test of a company's internal controls is not whether occasional failings occur, 
uh, that will happen in the most ideally managed company. <clears throat> what is um, really the the theory of enforcement on internal controls when it comes to uh, some of these enforcement actions, recognizing that the statute really provides no specifics about what type of internal controls an issuer should have? Well, first of all, I think a couple of things to keep in mind. The statute is written in a way, as you said, that it requires a company to provide to devise and maintain a system of internal controls sufficient to provide reasonable assurances that, and then it enumerates a number of things. So the first thing to keep in mind is that sometimes people want to think that internal accounting controls under the statute are the same thing as your um, IC. Um, your internal controls over financial reporting. They're not. Internal controls over financial reporting are part of your internal fin- accounting controls that you need to have under the statute, but that's not everything the statute covers because it requires you also to provide reasonable assurances that transactions are executed in accordance with management's general and, or specific authorization and access to assets is permitted only in accordance with management's general and specific authorization. The other thing, so they're broader and really that's typically where companies get tripped up on the FCPA side. It's that your internal controls aren't making sure that that um, access to assets is permitted only in accordance with your policies, which generally prohibit you from paying bribes. One thing to keep in mind is that although typically the in many cases the conduct is occurring at a subsidiary or usually a foreign subsidiary, a company is liable for the violations of the books and records and internal controls provisions that occur at its wholly owned subsidiary as if it's occurring at its own sub, at its at its own corporate headquarters. It's only if you own 50% or less of a um, subsidiary that you drop to a lower standard, which is just that you have to use good faith. So I think it's important to recognize that a company is responsible for making sure that the books and records of wholly owned subsidiaries and majority owned subsidiaries that are rolling up into the corporate books are accurate and that they have internal controls that are going to provide reasonable assurances that basically that they are um, that they're accurate and that the subsidiary is complying with um, with the company's policies the government tries very hard not to take action against the company for the one-off failure I know that people may not see that but part of the problem and honestly one of the frustrations when I was in government was that you couldn't tell people what they didn't see so you couldn't tell people about all the cases that you that the government knew about either because it was a self-report or because you got a whistleblower complaint and um, they ended up resulting in no investigation or no action where you were in in some cases there may have been a minor violation and you're still saying it's not worth bringing this case there are a few cases where i think you can see the government really trying to make that distinction one of them is the case that was brought against an individual last year employed by um, harris but there was no action taken against the pub, the parent company harris so it was only an action brought against an individual i think that was a good example of the sec saying we understand there are going to be some instances where it really is the individual's liability and it's really not appropriate to tag the company. But a lot of times, what we hear, what, when I was at the SEC, we would hear from companies is that it was a group of employees that did this. We didn't know about it. It was happening at a foreign subsidiary. And then you look and you say, all right, well, if it's the general manager of the subsidiary that's involved, you can't say it's a rogue employee if it's someone who is not, you know, it's, these aren't one-offs happening by low-level salespeople. Well, why can't why can't a general manager go rogue? I mean, does the term general manager necessarily connotate a low level employee? No, it doesn't. And one of the things, as I said, if you if you look at the Harris case, the individual who was charged was actually a very senior person. It was the it was the um, CEO and founder of the company that Harris acquired, and I think it was the CEO. He became their CEO of their Chinese operation. So it's definitely not the case that simply because it's a it's a person at a particular level that it. The government can't decide it's more appropriate to just charge the individual. Um, But I think when you look at the actions that the government brings, they try to identify red flags that were seen outside of the subsidiary. And when, and, you know, people can agree or disagree on what they should have done in response to those red flags, but it is the government really does spend a lot of time trying to get it right. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that particularly at the SEC, 
they're well positioned to address these issues because this isn't just the enforcement division. As you, um, as people may know, there's a very robust review process of any enforcement action that occurs, and the SEC is very lucky. They have an office of chief accountants full of accountants who spend all their time thinking about these provisions of the law. And um, I can tell you that when I was, when I was um, there, when there was a close call or when we weren't sure if it was a violation or not or if we were being too aggressive, they were always there to consult. You know, because with the benefit of hindsight, right, when you know who that problematic employee is, when you know who that problematic third party agent is, it's very easy, of course, with the benefit of hindsight to look back and say, well, there's things that company woulda, coulda, shoulda done. And because they didn't do that, that's an internal control violation. But is that the proper way to look at these things when the reality is a typical issuer will have thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of employees and third parties. And, you know, that's like saying, I I think we're having a pretty solid discussion here on this podcast, but with the benefit of hindsight, I may have asked the question a little bit differently, and maybe you might have answered it a little bit differently. Is it hindsight driven enforcement a lot? I don't think it's hindsight driven enforcement. I think um, everyone recognizes you can always do better. There's always a with hindsight, there's always a better way to do things. I think that's um, why the government spends a lot of time looking at exactly what the process was, what went wrong, and what the red flags were um, that were that were seen. And there are certain when I was in the government, and I know still, they spend a lot of time talking about companies needing to do sort of risk-based assessments and risk-based internal controls because you can't be everywhere. And I think when you look at the actions, you can see that a lot of the actions are occurring in areas that have already been identified by the government as high risk, where you have a government entity on the other side, where you have a defined benefit that a company is trying to um, is trying to achieve and where the government is saying these are areas where you your internal controls need to be flagging this so that you can make sure that these transactions that are higher risk are going to be done appropriately. Well, I appreciate you sharing that insight. You know, obviously, um, the books and records and internal control uh, provisions are sometimes viewed as the less important uh of the provisions, but I completely agree with you that, uh, at least as enforced, they're they're very potent. But you know, in some cases, you know, perhaps uh, uh, controversial as well, given actual legal authority, and and perhaps uh, congressional intent. Um, the final question really has to do with um, something that's not FCPA specific, but but something that o- occurred as well while you were the SEC. Uh, FCPA unit chief, and that's uh, the Dodd Frank Dodd Frank whistleblower provisions, um, where there's a reporting requirement that the SEC has to Congress to specifically identify sort of the substantive areas in which they're getting tips. Um, from those various SEC reports, we know that the SEC has received uh, close to 900 FCPA tips since the program uh, went live in 2010, but. Uh, there appears to be, perhaps uh, there have been more, I don't know, there appears to be just one uh, whistleblower uh, bounty paid uh, in connection with an FCPA tip, and that's sort of an extremely low yield rate. And I was wondering what accounts for this or, or what insight you can provide listeners uh, more broadly as to the SEC's whistleblower uh, provisions, as specifically as they relate to the FCPA. So here's the thing to keep in mind about the whistleblower program. It is, whistleblowers are allowed to report confidentially, and the identity of whistleblowers is held confidential, which means that even the staff of the SEC don't don't even necessarily know whether a bounty has been paid to a whistleblower on a particular case. So I can't comment on the one I think that you, that you think has been reported. I will say that there are going to be that, um, I, I can say, and I did say when I was the unit chief at um, publicly often that um, a number of the investigations and cases that the unit brought were the result of whistleblowers coming to um, the SEC. I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind about um, the statistics. First of all, whenever 
um, a company discloses that they're under investigation. It's not unusual for the SEC to get whistleblower tips in that are really just derivative of what's been reported in the in the media. And so of the 900 tips, you're not going to get 900 good tips. Um, but the SEC has gotten in some very significant tips that have really made a difference. There is one case where you can see that there was a whistleblower and that the whistleblower um, was in an FCPA case, and that's the Anheuser-Busch InBev case that was brought um, late last year. And the reason for that is because um, normally you can the SEC will never like, identify whether there is a whistleblower involved in a case or not. That's just the way that the Dodd-Frank whistleblower statute and the, regula- and the, uh, the SEC rules work. But in this case, the company was charged, in addition to the FCPA violations, with having a separation agreement that contained language that impeded the, their employees' communications with the commission, which, as you know, can be a violation, and in this case was found to be a violation of Rule 21 um, F-17. And so this is actually one case where you can see for a fact that there was a whistleblower and that that whistleblower was communicating um, with, the, uh, with the SEC. Well, thank you. Uh, today's guest is Kara Brockmeyer. Uh, you may recall that Ms. Brockmeyer served as the SEC's FCPA unit chief uh, from 2011 to uh, earlier this year. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to share with uh, FCPA Flash listeners your insight uh, and experience from your time at the SEC. Thank you, Mike. It was a pleasure.